Mark Francois, welcome to Acting Prime Minister. And Thank you. Thanks for hosting us here in your office. My pleasure. First day back from recess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How was it for you? Did you have a good time? Uh, really nice uh, break. Uh, my late mother was Italian and I was in uh, Naples for the best part of two weeks. Very relaxing, read four books, did no <laughs> politics, had some nice food and wine. Come back, day one. Here we are. <laughs> <laughs> Do you feel better for having had a break? Because a lot of MPs by the end of the last term were just exhausted, weren't they? And just sort of mentally a bit wound up. Yeah, well, I mean, I've been an MP now for 18 years. So, you, you know, you're used to when you come back in the autumn, you know, your colleagues come back from, you know, all points of the globe and everybody seems to look about 10 years younger. <laughs> and it normally lasts about a fortnight. <laughs> OK, well, look, there's no time to waste, is there, right, as you say. Yeah. we better send you through that Downing Street door because you've got to sort out Brexit. You've only got two months to go. So you unpack your box of belongings in Downing Street. Mm -hmm. right. You've got a few minutes just to gather yourself. Firstly, a couple of quick questions. Mm -hmm. What is the one photo you'd hang on the wall behind your desk, do you think? What one picture? Uh, a photograph of my father. OK, yeah. So he was a big inspiration to you? Very much so. He died when I was 14 years of age. I was still a boy. Um, but he taught me a he taught me a great deal. So my, my dad died in 1979, and unfortunately my mother then passed away in 2004. So technically I'm an orphan. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I put up uh, a photo uh, either of dad or of mum and dad. And that must be tough to be 14 and lose your dad. That's a very young age. Uh, what it, was that like? Well, it wasn't easy to be honest, and it was unexpected. Uh, he had angina. He had a heart condition. And he was down for a, for a heart bypass, which back in 1979 was still quite a big thing. I mean, now we regard it as reg a regular event, mm. but in those days it was a big op. But unfortunately, he died of a heart attack in the night a couple of months before the operation was due to take place. So I was a very happy, well-adjusted 14-year-old. You know, I go to bed with a mummy and a daddy, and I wake up and I'm, I haven't got a dad anymore. So that, that was tough to take, yeah. Do you think it changed you as a person then? Because it was very I, I think. Years. Um, I think you have to grow up quickly yeah. because obviously I had to then, you know, help look after mum. Mm. Um, they were very much in love, so you know she took it hard. Mm. So uh, yeah, it kind of accelerates you. You mm. know, you you just have to grow up quickly. You don't really have much choice in the matter. So yes, it was a very formative event in my life. I think, but I was very lucky. I had two extremely loving parents. You know. I grew up in a council estate, you know, in Basildon in Essex. I had a very humble start in life, mm. but I came from an incredibly loving home. And without my parents, I would never have got anywhere near where I've got today. So you've got your photo of your dad on the wall. Yeah. And then who's the first person you'd like to call, do you think? Well, I suppose if you're the, uh, if you're the British Prime Minister, probably your first call is to the President of the United States, isn't okay. it? Yeah, that's, um, a, that's a regular a regular answer on this. Well, I'm, on I'm this sorry topic. to be I'm no, sorry no. to be unoriginal, but they are our <clears throat> they are our strongest ally. Yeah, and you know I'd want to just make sure that everything was in good order then. And what's the drink you'd pour yourself while you're having a chat to President Trump on the phone? Uh, well, it depends. If, if it was early in the day, it might just be a cup of coffee. Uh, if it was a bit later on, uh, I like uh, I like good malt scotch. Okay, all right. Well, look for people who dip in and out of of politics. I suppose. One of the reasons they might know you is because your profile has just gone absolutely crazy since since Brexit happened. You are um, the vice chair of uh, the ERG. Yep. Uh, you're effectively the whip as well for the ERG. So you kind of uh, you're in charge of discipline for that group in Parliament. You encourage them about how they might like to vote on certain very important issues around Brexit. Um, now you've got to deliver Brexit, though. You're the Prime Minister. So how would you how would you go about it? What would your plan be? Do you think? Well, I think what we <laughs> I would say, where do we ultimately want all this to end up? What's mm. the desired end state we want to arrive at and work back from that? And the desired end state, I believe, is a comprehensive free trade agreement between ourselves and our EU partners, which would allow us to trade equitably with low or, in some cases, even no tariffs at all you know, out into the foreseeable future, and based probably uh, uh, around something called the EU-Canadian Agreement that was signed in 2016, but mm -hmm. with some additions. So the concept is sometimes referred to as Super Canada. Yeah, yeah, or Canada uh, plus, plus, Canada plus plus. Canada plus plus plus, yeah. yeah. So, so, so basically, you, you take that agreement, because by definition the EU accept it, because they've signed it, mm. but you would then add on to it, these are your pluses, so you'd probably add a protocol on security, because we still have very important security relationships with uh, in Europe. 
you'd probably add a protocol on data, you know, some other elements as well. Okay. Uh, but, but, you know, I believe you could do that relatively quickly because you're not starting with a clean sheet of paper. So coming back to the current withdrawal agreement, then I suppose the question in terms of today's politics is if Boris Johnson removes just the backstop from that withdrawal agreement, is that enough for you to vote for it in Parliament? No. When, uh, prior to the first parliamentary ballot, when uh, Boris was all desperate for the ERG to vote for him, he had a meeting uh, in the room next door to here uh, with the senior leadership of the ERG and he absolutely adamantly promised us that the withdrawal agreement was dead. He said it several times. Now, if a politician makes an absolute commitment to me, I expect them to keep their word, whether they're a prime minister or a parish councillor. So, no, I'm not voting for the withdrawal agreement, and I suspect neither will many of my colleagues. So he can't just remove that backstop and expect you guys to vote it through? There's too much else that's wrong with the withdrawal agreement. It's not just all about the backstop. The backstop, in many ways, is the worst part, but there are lots of other parts of it that are wrong too. So, as Vice Chair of the ERG, would you, would you be advising your colleagues to hold firm and... and hold out for a no-deal Brexit rather than voting through a withdrawal agreement that, that removes the Well, backstop. remember, it's the House of Commons that voted down the withdrawal agreement. It wasn't just the ERG, mm. and it was voted down decisively three times. And if the Prime Minister were to bring back pretty much the same withdrawal agreement, I expect he'd get pretty much the same result. So I don't think it's going to go through. Obviously, there are some pretty fractious weeks ahead, even more fractious now, given today's news. We're recording this on the day that the Prime Minister has announced, has announced that he will prorogue Parliament for a Queen's speech. Do you think that's the right approach to take? I mean, you're a parliamentarian. Well, you, that, that's normal. I mean, you would no normally prorogue Parliament before a Queen's mm. speech. That is not some constitutional uh, outrage. It's what usually happens. And we've had the longest session of Parliament for, 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 for many, many years. So we're due a Queen's speech. Mm and normally you prorogue Parliament before the Queen's speech takes place. It's just the timing though, isn't it? People will think this is very convenient timing and probably quite clever timing by the Prime Minister to have, to have a Queen's speech now so that he can suspend Parliament and, and remove the, the risk, really, that, that MPs well, you, try and block no deal. Well, you, you still have, if, if the Queen's speech is on the 14th of October, you've still then got three weeks until, until Brexit Day. So it's not as if the House of Commons wouldn't have an opportunity to debate these matters. Mm. But, but what I think is really important is what are MPs seeking to achieve? Now, we've been arguing about Europe in the House of Commons almost from the day that we joined. And in the end, the one thing that we managed to agree on as MPs is that we couldn't agree. Mm -hmm. So we, we voted overwhelmingly to put the question to the people in a referendum. Now, and everybody agreed that they would abide by the result. Now, if you're a cynic, you could say that's because both sides maybe thought they were going to win. But nevertheless, MPs overwhelmingly promised to abide by the result. The difficulty has been the result was not what a lot of very pro-EU MPs expected it to be. And they spent three years doing everything in their power to overturn the decision of the people. That's why we've gone round in circles for three years. So I think it would be wrong for members of parliament who voted for a referendum, who voted to the, give the decision to the people to then try and obstruct that decision which was democratically arrived at. 17.4 million people, the biggest vote in British history for any proposition ever at all. The people have given their decision and I believe MPs who work for the people, not the other way around, mm. should respect their decision. Do you think it's a bit hypocritical then of some MPs who, who, who support Remain or at least oppose No Deal to be saying today, oh, this is subverting democracy? Well, it, it, it's not because we'd still mm. have three weeks after we get back after mm. prorogation to debate the matters. But what I think is hypocritical is when people say, I don't want us to crash out with No Deal, that's code. What that means is I don't actually want us to leave the European Union under any circumstances whatsoever. That's what I really think. But because of the referendum, I can't say that. So I'm going to say I don't want us to leave with no deal. Mm. But what I really mean is I just don't want us to leave under any circumstances. Well, that, I think, is the hypocritical part of it. We need to get back to you being Prime Minister in a minute. But just yeah. before we do, just, on, just lastly on this, on these fractious weeks ahead, I mean, you've enjoyed being, well, I say you've enjoyed, I don't know whether you have enjoyed, but you've been the rebel for the past you know, couple of years. You've been the one on the backbenches amongst many who, who've had to sort of stand up for Brexit and argue against the Prime Minister's withdrawal agreement. Now you're sort of a, you know, a bit more on the inside track and actually it's people like Philip Hammond who've ended up as rebels. 
How do you feel about seeing you know Philip Hammond on the back benches and 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 the way that they're likely to behave in the next few weeks and, and the, the tables turning in that way? Well, I worked for Philip Hammond for two years at the MOD. I was his second in command. Oh yeah. And um, maybe we'll talk about that another time. But uh, what I do find really surprising about Philip's position is look, he's the member for you know Runny you know for Runnymede and Weybridge, right? Mm. They signed Magna Carta in his constituency, <clears> for goodness sake. And the man who represents the place where we signed Magna Carta doesn't seem to understand the basic principles of democracy. I find that really surprising. What do you think you'll say to him when you see him on those back benches? Uh, uh, we're leaving, Philip. <laughs> <laughs> do you think you'll miss that rebel status? Uh, I never wanted to be a rebel. Look, I, I was a government whip. I was the operations officer for the whips office. Mm. Uh, you know, I've been an army officer. You know, I'm, I'm normally a lawyer. I'm a joiner, right? But, but I've taken the position I've taken uh, because I passionately believe that we must respect the result of the referendum. If you want to know what really kind of swung me, it was when I was the Shadow Europe Minister from 2007 to 10. William Hague was the Shadow Foreign Secretary and we debated the Lisbon Treaty. Mm. for which you know, we never had a referendum. And we spent 14 nights in Parliament debating the details of that treaty, night after night after night. And it became apparent that we couldn't change so much as a single punctuation mark in the treaty. The House of Commons had been totally neutered. And at the end of that, because the whole process took several months, you know, I kind of went home one evening and thought, we've got to get out of this. We, we don't run our own country. We're, we've become a total rubber stamp for the decisions of other people. And so that was my epiphany, if you like. That's what really turned me into a Eurosceptic, was, was the Lisbon Treaty experience, on which we should have had a referendum, but unfortunately we never did. Um, but I actually believe, and it was after Lisbon that really you saw the rise of UKIP, Mm. I believe that those pro-Europeans who thought they were being really clever by ramming Lisbon through without a <coughs> referendum actually created the conditions uh, under which we event Britain eventually voted to leave the EU and to, to take back control of our own of our own destiny. And what have these past three years been like for you? Because you know you're only human. You get you get a lot of flack. You have to debate colleagues who you know you like some of them, but you have to stand next to them in the chamber and have a row. It's quite a um, an intense atmosphere, isn't it? It, it is, but you know, I, I, I believe I was elected here to, to stand up for, you know, what I what I believe to be right. Has it been stressful? Yes. Has it been difficult? Yes. Have I sometimes had to agree with people who were good friends of mine? Uh, uh, yes, yes, I have. But uh, I believe that it is democracy that's at stake. It's that serious. This is because of all the delays and the obstructions. This has morphed. It's no longer just leave the remain. It's the establishment versus the people. And the people wanted to leave and the people must triumph. Mm. A lot of MPs say privately that they feel that this, this whole period has, has been quite detrimental actually to their mental health. They just feel as if it's been really stressful to the point of you know, feeling pretty depressed about it. I mean, do you, have, it, you got, it, have you got to points well, where you look, just feel it has been, stressed it, out? It, it has been very stressful um, you know it's been, it's been really it's been really difficult um, but you know I believe we you know we've got to a point now where we've got to complete this process we must leave at Halloween we absolutely must do mm. you know so the kind of the you know the finishing line is in sight and and that night when I believe we will leave I think it's, it's there's a greater than 95 percent chance we're going to leave now and you know that night I'm not going to go to bed you know, I'm going to stay up, uh, you know, with some friends, maybe with a bottle of something nice, and then I'm going to watch the sunrise on a on a free country. There have been times as well when the language in this debate has got pretty out of hand. I mean, you were criticised yourself for, for running your finger along your neck as if it was sort of a, a knife, a cutting motion in reference to Theresa May. Do you do you regret? Sometimes losing your temper a bit. Well, no, no. On well, that point, I mean, all I meant was, uh, 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 all I meant was, you know, look, this is all over. That, that, yeah. that, that, that's all I was trying to say. People thought it was maybe quite violent imagery. No, no, no. It wasn't. It, it certainly. Well, let me clear that up. It certainly was not meant like that in any okay. way at all. You know, what I really was saying is, you know, sort of, you know, game over. Mm. Because I, I think in, with, with, with Theresa May, 
she made a number of mistakes, and let's not dwell on all that. But I think for a lot of ordinary members of the Tory party, I think the straw that broke the camel's back was when she entered into those talks with Jeremy Corbyn. You know, when, uh, you know, when she got, as, as what somebody put it, when she got into, a bed, and got into bed with a Marxist, mm. ideally. Mm. And, and, and I think at that point, a lot of ordinary party members thought, what are we doing? You know, this man is our kind of sworn enemy. Why are we now relying on him to try and get this thing through the House of Commons? I think for lots of ordinary Tory party members, at least many of the people that I spoke to, th that's what did it. Does it bother you that you sometimes get a bit of flack? Well, um, you've got to be a bit thick-skinned in this game. No one likes to be criticised, but for every email I've had, you know, calling me nasty names, I've had I've had a supportive one. I've had lots, particularly from constituents. My constituency voted to leave sixty-seven thirty-three. You know, uh, certainly my constituents overwhelmingly have been behind me, and you know, and I've had lots of support. Uh, I mean, on the light-hearted note, uh, my long-suffering PA walked in the other morning. Uh, she's on holiday today, gave me my cup of coffee and she says, um, do you want the good news or the bad news? So I said, well, she said, look, she said, I've just played back the voicemail messages on the answer phone and there's this really nice message from a very lovely sounding lady and she says, she's seen you on the telly again passionately arguing for Brexit and if you carry on like this, she may feel compelled to propose marriage. <laughs> and I'm like, crumbs. I said, did she sound, no, she sounds lovely. I said, okay, so what's the bad news? She says, well, I've, I've traced the call. Her name's Ethel, and she lives in a care home in Cumbria. <laughs> so, uh, uh, Ethel, is, if, Ethel, just a number. If, if, Ethel just a number. if by any chance you're watching this, bless you. Uh, that, that's so sweet. So, I, I've had all sorts, but I've had lot, I could show you lots of emails from people saying, you know, you tell it like it is. That's the phrase I get mm, again and mm. again. You're speaking up for what we all believe. For God's sake, keep going. Don't let them bully you. So, having had a nice holiday and a rest and a break over recess, you don't you don't feel like you want to dial down the the rhetoric. I mean, we, we've done interviews before and where you've got really passionate and you've had a bit of a go at me sometimes. But you're you're quite happy to, that, that that's the right approach. You're passionate about this and you're not going to you're not going to change what, what, your tone. What, what have we been up against? We've been up against you know. Uh, what was the, the previous government. Mm. We were up against the Labour Party, the Liberal Democrats, Change UK, or whatever they're called this week, uh, uh, the BBC, the CBI, the, the, the Bank of England, you know, the whole weight of the establishment. And if you're not quite robust, you're going to get crushed very, very quickly. Mm. So, you know, you either, you know, you, if that's what you really believe, and I do passionately, if people don't know that by now, they haven't been watching kind of thing, you know, it, you, you've got to be robust in order to survive in that environment and make an argument. Uh, unless you're prepared to be quite feisty, you're just going to get steamrolled. And if it hadn't have been for uh, the ERG, we would already have signed the withdrawal agreement. We would already be locked in a customs union uh, forever. We would never, ever have had an opportunity to leave the EU. So I would argue we're not the bad guys, we're the good guys. Mm. We're arguing for what 17.4 million people voted for. All I really want is for us to leave the European Union and become a free country. And I'm passionate about that, but at the end of the day, what's wicked about that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. OK, well, look, let's get back to you being Prime Minister now, because right. we've got a bit sidetracked here, haven't we? So you've got to make your first speech as Prime Minister, and you can you can talk about whatever you want. It doesn't need to be Brexit. This might be a chance for us to, to get to know you a bit better, away from away from your Brexiteer credentials. What do you think the message is you want to drive home in that speech? What would your kind of priorities be? Well, it depends when it was. If, if it mm. were before the 31st of October, I'd give a speech called Global Britain. Mm -hmm and I talk about the role that, that, that we can play on the world stage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, you know, as a member of, you know, the permanent five of the United Nations, as a member of the G7, as a force for good in the world that would stand up for democracy, a rules-based system, human rights. I mean, these are all things that I would want to emphasise if I were a British Prime Minister, that actually we have a very important role to play in the world not just economically, but politically and militarily. We're a staunch supporter of NATO. Um, uh, these are all the, all the pluses that I would want to, that I would want to emphasize. Yeah. If it were after we'd left the European Union, then I think I'd want to talk about uh, a domestic agenda. Mm. Uh, and there I agree with a lot of what, you know, the Boris Johnson as Prime Minister is talking about. Um, you know, we do need to, to do more to fight 
crime and violence. We do need more police officers. We do need to invest more in the National Health Service, although I think there's an issue about how effectively that money gets spent. Mm -hmm. We want to see it go into patient care, not into bureaucracy. Um, you know, uh, I'm passionate about education. I've got 33 schools in my patch. I visited them all. You see, mm. I hope this doesn't sound uh, chippy, mm. but you know, I went to a bog standard comprehensive. Um, uh, you know, I went through the, the, the gates of that school in Basildon in 1976. There were 226 kids in the first year seniors, as it was in old money. So, yeah. September 76, 226 kids walked through those gates. How many do you think got to university out of that 226? Must have been a tiny percentage in those days, right? Two. Two. Literally less than one percent. And I've always been furious about that waste of talent. There were lots of other kids who could at least have benefited from a university mm. education if, the, if it had even been explained to them what that was. That school, with a few honourable exceptions, had a bunch of teachers who, who had incredibly low aspirations for the kids and whose job they saw it was to punch out kids with CSEs to go and work in factories and be secretaries. Mm. Those kids were worth far more than that, and I've always been passionate about educational opportunity ever since, because, you know, I went to a bog-standard comprehensive that metaphorically broke those kids' legs. Mm. And if you could introduce one policy then as Prime Minister, what do you think it would be? Um, I think I would want to see more choice and opportunity in education. Mm. I certainly think that Boris saying we've got to up the standard amount per pupil uh, outside of London. London historically has been very generously funded per, per head, per pupil. It's not the same in many other parts of the country and I would want to try and, uh, I'd want to try and even that up. So how do you think, you know, you went to that same bog standard comprehensive, I went yeah. to bog standard comprehensive, there's no yeah. shame in it. Yeah. Uh, very proud of my bog standard comprehensive, but you know, you had the same opportunities as all the other kids in that school. So what, what, what was it about you, you think, that, that got you firstly to university? Uh, I think you did a master's as well, didn't you? I did, yeah. And, and then secondly, you know, here in Parliament to become an MP, to become a government minister, what, what was it about you, do you think? What was it, was it you know, a great mum? Was, what was it that got you out well, of Well, as I said, it was undoubtedly having two loving and very supportive parents. I mm. mean, my father was a, uh, was a shift worker. You know, he worked, he did hard physical work. But, you know, he, he worked overtime for a year to buy an Encyclopedia Britannica. Mm. Uh, you know, remember, no, no internet in those days, you know, to help me with my studies. Because I think they, they recognised they had a sort of reasonably bright kid on their hands and they wanted to do everything they could as parents to encourage that child to have the best possible start in life. So, you know, that, that, that's how my father did that. And, and I'll forever be grateful to him and to him and mum. Why did I want to become a Member of Parliament? Well, um, Dad had been in the war. He, he'd been on a minesweeper at D-Day. I'm very proud of that. So when mm. I was a little kid, I wanted to be a soldier. I, I wanted to be a general. That's what I wanted to right. be. And, uh, and I started reading about the history of the war and the background and, and Hitler and appeasement and all of that. And then I come across this guy called Winston Churchill who you know, saw it all coming and everybody said he was mad and no one believed him and he was a member of parliament. And well, what was all that about? And he made these amazing speeches in somewhere called the House of Commons. And what was all that about? Mm. And the more I read, the more fascinated I became. So I remember by the time I was about 13 years of age, I decided that's what I want to do. I want to be a member of parliament. And I remember telling my father that. And you've got to remember in those days, but you know, MPs were looked on completely differently from the way they are now. Yeah. They, were, they were still very much looked up to in their constituencies. And... Um, you know, my father, you know, as a working class guy, mm. was really pleased that his son wanted to aspire to this. He was delighted. And, uh, and then a year later, he was gone. So one of my great regrets is that, you know, he was never alive to see mm. me become an MP. Mm. But I, I like to think that, you know, maybe he was, maybe he was looking down that night, as it were. Yeah. So, so that, that's kind of what made me want to become a, a, a member of parliament. Yeah. And then obviously, you know, I had to study and, and I figured, you know, a degree would be helpful in all of that. Yeah. And then, so, and it all went from there. So I suppose I was driven from about the age of about 12 or 13. And then how did you find parliament when you got here? Because there aren't many people from working class background like yours. 
the best analogy I can give you is it's a bit like that transition from junior school to senior school. So you know, you turn up at this massive building, right? Yeah. Everybody knows where they're going except you. Mm. Yeah. Uh, there are all these rules and procedures you've got to learn very quickly. Mm. There are prefects to tell you off if you get it wrong. They're called the whips office. <laughs> you know, and you you kind of, it's a tremendous amount to take in, and I think it probably takes you about a year or so really to kind of find your feet to get used to the tension between trying to be in two places at, uh, at once all the time and to kind of learn the ropes learn the procedures and get a feel for how parliament works mm. certainly it took me about a year i'm sure other brighter people picked it up far more quickly but you know it does take you a while to kind of you know to play yourself into yeah. your cricketing yeah, energy. yeah of course let's just get a flavor of where you are on some other policies as well and where you might be as, as prime minister so um, you voted against the hunting ban, um, you voted against gay marriage, um, against same-sex adoption. So I think people would put you traditionally on the right of the party. Think that's, is that fair? Oh, I've been called many things in my <laughs> life, but, but never, well, how would you le never, le it? never left winger. Yeah. <laughs> how, how, how would you describe where you are on the political scale? Would you say you were a right winger? Or well, I'd say I'm on the centre right. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I suppose I'm a Thatcherite Tory, if you wanted to give it a label. Mm -hmm. Uh, um, but I, I've always been a, a fierce believer in uh, in opportunity, you know, particularly from people who came from, you know, humble backgrounds like myself. I'm proud to come from Essex. I, I applied in 1999 for the Kensington and Chelsea by-election. You remember the one that Portillo won? Oh yeah. yeah I, I got into the final. Yeah. And I remember being interviewed in the first mm. round by this sort of uh, uh, the, the Kensington and Chelsea Selection Committee, who in those days were sort of legendary within the Tory party. And this sort of dowager duchess type from deepest Chelsea said to me in a cut glass accent, Mr. Francois, he said, we all say you are proud to call yourself an Essex man. And I said, no, madam, I would not. Yeah. I said, but I would say I was very proud to call myself a man from Essex. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. And do you think you've changed any of your views over time? Do you think? Yes, I have. So, 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 let me give you one example on uh, on uh, uh, gay marriage. Yeah. The reason I voted against it, and mm. you may not believe me, I did read the bill very carefully, and I had lots of representations, particularly from from my churches, that we've got a very active church movement in my constituency. Sure from hundreds of people who were worried that if the bill went through, they would be, be forced to uh, conduct gay marriages against their deeply held religious beliefs. Yeah. And I was worried that under the ECHR, there would be a test case that mm -hmm. we would lose, and therefore that would come to pass. As it turned out, uh, there has been no such test case. No one's forced anybody uh, in any church to marry a gay couple against what they believe. Mm -hmm. Uh, and therefore, those fears were, as it turned out, unfounded. And, you know, gay people can get married and, and good luck to them. You know, the sky hasn't fallen in and we've all got on, and we've all got on with our lives. So um, I, I've explained why I voted against the bill, but, you mm -hmm. know, those fears did not, did not come to pass. OK, OK. All right, some quick-fire questions now yeah. to finish off. Um, which country would you plan to visit first? Um, you're probably going to say America now, aren't you? Because you said President Trump would be your first call. Uh, or Italy, because uh, my, late, yeah, okay. my late mother was Italian, mm -hmm. and uh, their politics are quite interesting at the moment. So, um, I, you know, if I wanted to visit an EU country, I probably wouldn't go to France first, but I'd probably, I'd probably go to Italy. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the first thing you'd ban as Prime Minister? Um, uh, I'm tempted to say uh, 38 degrees. <laughs> The campaign uh, group. Uh, yeah, because y y you get the same emails from the same people uh, again and again and again and again. But at the end of the day, it's, uh, it's their democratic right. Okay. And how would you let off steam as Prime Minister? What do you do to unwind? Uh, I, like to, I like to do a bit of running, although uh, at my age I'm never going to worry the Olympic selectors too much. So uh, I still like to play a little bit of sport. I like to read. I like to go hill walking. I find that quite relaxing as well. So uh, a little bit of exercise and some and some and a few good books <coughs> and the same maybe the uh, maybe even a, uh, a drop of malt scotch. <laughs> Hill walking obviously a common uh, pastime of many prime ministers. Yeah. Um, what would your vice be as prime minister? Maybe that's scotch. 
Yeah, I mean, I think there, 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 there are worse vices to uh, there are worse, the worst vices to have in life. <laughs> yeah. And would you ever want to be prime minister? Do you think? I think when you, I mean, I re look, so I remember turning up here in two thousand and one, you know, at carriage gates, and you were asked to bring a copy of your election address, mm. you know, just to prove to the sort of copper on the gate who you were. And um, I think on that day that you turn up, on that first day at school, you're entitled to dream one day of being driven down the mall to meet Her Majesty the Queen. Yeah. When you've been here a bit of a while, like school, you kind of work out what the pecking order really is and how okay, likely yeah, you are ever yeah. to become a head boy or head girl. So uh, I think in my case, it's probably a bit of a stretch, mm -hmm. uh, but thank you, for, th thank you for playing the game. Um, uh, you never know. I mean, th that's, that's the thing about this place is anything could happen. Anything could happen. Well, uh, if you'll allow me to say so, uh, because of the, the events of the last two or three years, I've decided to write a book. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to call it, you couldn't make it up. It, because the, being an, an MP in the 21st century sometimes is so bizarre, mm. uh, you get into all sorts of situations that people would think, oh, you, you must have invented that, and you really don't. So, uh, yeah, you never quite know. I mean, one thing about this job, it has tremendous privileges. I mean, Benjamin Disraeli said the greatest opportunity that can be offered to an Englishman is a seat in the House of Commons, and that's probably still true. It has tremendous privileges, but it also has big downsides, you know, particularly, you know, for your family and stuff like that. Yeah. So, so um, on balance, is it still worth doing it? Yes. But, you know, whereas 20 years ago, I would have said to someone unhesitatingly, yeah, if you want to be an MP, pursue your dream. I'd still advise people to do it, but I think 20 years on or 18 years on, I'd say go into it with your eyes wide open. Okay, good advice. Thanks yeah. so much, Mark Francois, for coming on Acting Prime Minister. I oh, really enjoyed it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much indeed. Yeah.